Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Rose? Well, we're going, we don't need Rose. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. No, I am your father. You're listening to After the Ending. The only film podcast where we tell you what happens after the ending of your favorite films. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Spring and Phil Edwards. Hello and welcome to another episode of After the Ending. I'm Mike Spring and with me as always is... Phil Edwards. How are you doing today, Phil? Everything's five by five. I'm in the pipe. Mike, how are you? (laughs) Very good, thank you. So, Phil, we've got some exciting and fun films to talk about tonight. Why don't we jump right into things? Tell our listeners what we're going to be after the ending-ing, if I can make that a verb. We will be after the ending-ing-ing-ing. Bridesmaids, that's the one starring Kristen Wiig, Rose Byrne, and Melissa McCarthy, directed by Paul Feig. Is it Paul Feig? Feig? I've heard it. I've heard it about you know thirteen different ways. So whichever one you want to go with is fine with me. So it's directed by Paul, (laughs) (laughs) who's also directing the new Ghostbusters film, which Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy are starring in. And we, but first, we will be starting with 2009's District Nine. That's the Neil Blomkamp sci-fi film starring Charlotte Copley. All right. Well, why don't you take us through the events of District 9? Yeah, so it's shot like a found footage, well, like a TV documentary to begin with. Uh, And we are told in 1982, a huge alien spaceship appeared over Johannesburg, South Africa, and just hovered there. A team was sent in and they found a bunch of sick aliens that they nicknamed prawns because of the way they look. The South African government set up a, a camp, which is called District 9, and that's where the aliens are housed. We then moved to 2010, and there have been conflicts between the prawns and humans over the years, and multinational United, MNU, are brought in to re- relocate the aliens. We then introduced to uh, Vickers von der Meer, uh, played by Charlotte Copley, in his very first uh, professional acting gig, and he does an amazing job. Uh, he leads the relocation, and we find out his character got the job from his father-in-law. We then see an alien who's called Christopher Johnson, is scavenging tech and the various junk piles around uh, District 9. Vickers starts questioning Christopher Johnson and finds some of the tech he's been gathering, and he's, while he's messing with it, Vickers gets sprayed by some of this fluid which was in this container. Thus begins a change in Vickers, which sees his uh, arm changing to become more alien and his eye and things like this. It's a slow, slow gradual change, but it's, it's one that obviously scares him. But the change also means he can use the alien technology and weapons, which is something that the, uh, the government have been trying to do ever since the aliens arrived. So the MNU want to cut Vickers up uh, because of the changes he's going through, but he manages to escape. And the MNU start a smear campaign about Vickers, saying he's been doing saucy things with the aliens uh, while they hunt him down. And unfortunately, this means Vickers' wife and daughter start believing the rumours which have been spread, which uh, adds to Vickers' heartbreak. Vickers meets up with Christopher, who t- turns out he's been hiding the command module for the mothership, and the liquid that sprayed Vickers was uh, fuel for the ship, and it's now at MNU HQ. Christopher Johnson says he'll be able to reverse the changes in Vickers if they can get it from the clutches of MNU. Uh, they get some weapons from a Nigerian arms dealer and they attack MNU, get the canister and make it back to District 9. However, Christopher Johnson saw that MNU was experimenting on his fellow aliens and says he, he will be off to get help before curing Vickers. Obviously, Vickers isn't happy about this but understands and he say, he's told it will take three years for the return trip. Uh, Christopher Johnson and Vickers are captured but Christopher's son activates the mothership and also a handy alien battlesuit which was lying around, which Vickers jumps into and blows seven bells out of the bad guys. Christopher manages to fly up to the mothership and leaves with the promise to return in three years. We are then told that MNU's experiments are exposed, District 9 is knocked down and the aliens are moved to District 10. Vickers' wife finds a metal flower on her doorstep and we now see a now fully transformed Vickers making another flower. The end. Very nice. Okay, then, Mike, so what have you got for the day after? Well, the day after, uh, Christopher and his son obviously make it back to the mothership and take off. They set up shop on the ship on the journey back to their home planet, uh, and they start working on it, trying to make improvements, get the ship clean from the disease, the sickness that they all had in the beginning of the film when they arrived at Earth. Yeah. Meanwhile, Vickis is basically a homeless alien. He ends up adopting Christopher's identity 
uh, to make his way into District 10, but he becomes a hermit. You know, he's pretty scarred from this whole experience. So he takes up in a shack in District 10 and just basically the prawn abides, if you will. He doesn't really <laughs> do anything. He just exists. Back up in the ship, Christopher lives up to his word, though, and starts working on a cure for Vicus while the ship is traveling through the cosmos. So that's my day after. How about you? Okay, so for my day after, I've got uh, Vicus's wife, Tanya, holds out hope that her husband will return. She's still not sure exactly what happened to him. Uh, investigations begin into MNU uh, for what they've been doing with the experiments and things which uh, came to light. Uh, Vickers tries to hold on to his humanity, but he's now that he's fully transformed, it makes this difficult. But the love for his family keeps him going. And Christopher Johnson heads back to the Andromeda Galaxy, but the anger at what he saw in the MNU HQ begins to grow and fester within him. So that's my day after. What about your immediate aftermath? All right. So in the immediate aftermath, Christopher Johnson and his son, they get the mothership into pretty much, you know, good working order again. And so he continues, they continue their journey back to what they hope will be their home planet. But when they get there, they find that the, the disease that was sickening them in the beginning has basically wiped out all life on the planet. So they're effectively homeless. They can't return to their planet and they don't really know where else to go. So they decide to head back to Earth because They've sort of left a lot of their people there. Yeah. And Christopher wants to live up to his word and deliver the cure to Vickus. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Vickus has pretty much uh, given up hope of Christopher ever coming back for him. You know, he, he was hopeful for a while. And even though it hasn't, you know, three years hasn't come yet, he's, he's sort of given up. He's just decides yeah. that there's no way that this prawn is going to come back and help him. But eventually he starts to emerge from his self-imposed exile and he starts to venture out again. Uh, occasionally he leaves a metal flower on his wife's front doorstep or some other metal sculpture just to remind her that he's still out there. And he begins to become friends with other prawns, and he witnesses more brutalities executed against the prawns by the humans. Even though District 10 is this new, shinier, bigger place, it doesn't stop the humans from coming in when they want to and treating the, the prawns badly. A couple of years after the events of the film... After a particularly brutal incident, a prawn uprising occurs. Uh, Vickus doesn't lead it, but he does get caught up in it, and he uses his knowledge of human tactics and MNU procedures to help the prawns gain some advantages and win some key battles. But ultimately, it's not enough, and the humans slaughter many of the prawns. Vickus gets injured, but he survives, and District 10 still exists, but it's been it's been reduced by a, by a solid number because the humans sort of came in and okay, yeah, yeah. scorched earth <laughs> yeah, policy, yeah. if you will. So, I can see that. Yeah, so there we go. A little dark, but I think it fits. The, the film itself was pretty dark. So Definitely, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I've got Christopher Johnson. Mine's a bit similar, but diverges and from yours uh, Christopher Johnson I say gets back to his home planet and he tells the others what he has seen it is his race had been in control of the mothership they went some kind of slave race but uh, the disease had ravaged them but he, when he gets back they find that it's now been cured and the population is steadily uh, building up again so he tells the others what he's seen and they develop a plan for their return to earth meanwhile Vickers has become an informal spokesman for the prawns and gets better treatments and facilities for them although humanity still dislikes them he keeps visiting Tanya when he can, and she realizes it could be Vickers, but she finds it hard to actually accept that. I think at the back of her mind, she's going, well, this could be it, but then part of us thinking this is ludicrous, or if it's true, what the what the hell do we do? Right, I mean, plus that would kind of put a, a, a damper on their love life, I would imagine, you know? <laughs> Just a little bit, I yeah, mean, especially, if, especially if he's eating tins of cat food. <laughs> right, she, <laughs> she might find the prawns attractive, but I'm guessing probably not. Yeah, it's gonna, it's a hard jump, isn't it, to go from species you know it's a species love i think so and they're they're really not a, they're really not an attractive species let's be honest no they weren't no no <laughs> oh, that, that's a that's a whole different film isn't it really <laughs> right, it really is it's like a it's like love story only you know with a twist yeah <laughs> and a slice of lemon Le what a slice of lemon you know lemon and prawn and yeah. seafood <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> The MNU investigation's finished, but nothing really comes of it. The execs are simply moved around to different uh, different posts and different companies, and it's all sort of pushed under the carpet what they were doing. And that's what I've got for my immediate aftermath. What have you got for the long term? Well, Christopher Johnson has succeeded in creating the cure for Vickus, and so since he's on his way back to Earth anyway, uh, he gets makes preparations to deliver the cure. So when they arrive at Earth, Christopher sends his son, who's now basically the equivalent of a teenager, down to Earth with a cure for Vickus. After some searching through District 10, he finds Vickus and administers the cure. And Vickus is very touched by this because he had given up on Christopher ever returning yeah. to help him. So he basically realizes that 
this alien race treated him more honorably than the human race did, and that really has an effect on him. So he goes to see his wife, and now he's human again. Okay. So, yeah. He goes to see her, and he basically goes to, to say goodbye to her because even though he's human again, he's still a fugitive. He's, his name has still been smeared, you know, for having, yeah. you know, relations with the prawns and stuff like that. So he's decided that he can't live on Earth anymore and he's going to go with the prawns because Christopher Johnson has come back to take all of his people away. Okay. So basically he collects all the prawns from Earth and, and Vickus goes with them and they set off into the stars looking for a new planet to inhabit. Basically what happens is Vickus becomes sort of a leader in the prawns, even though he's from a different species they have a lot of respect for him because the way he fought for them yeah. during the uprising yeah and because christopher and him have this connection so christopher and him sort of are like the co-leaders of the prawns eventually they land on another planet that they decide to call home Vickus tries to lead them well, but his bitterness towards humanity combined with Christopher's bitterness towards humanity seeps through, and it sort of becomes eventually a kind of collective hatred of humans. Now, on this new planet, it's a different sort of atmosphere, different environment, and so the prawns begin to mutate. Okay. So over the course of the next 100, 200 years, they evolve into bug-like creatures. <laughs> I think I know where this is going. <laughs> Eventually, I, I, I'd like to know more. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to know more? <laughs> Eventually, as their technology develops, they, they begin to launch long range attacks on planet Earth, destroying large cities and effectively launching a war against humanity, who has no idea that the prawns even exist or, anymore or have evolved. The only thing left to protect the Earth several hundred years in the future <laughs> Johnny Rico and the Starship Troopers. You called it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's really good. That, I never would have thought of that at all. That was, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I got the idea. Once I had the idea in my head, I was trying not to necessarily tie it into another movie, but yeah. once I had the idea in my head, I couldn't get rid of it, and the timeline worked out. No, that seems, that seems like a natural progression. You could see that happen. Yeah. Right. I, like I mean, that. the prawns certainly aren't going to be fans of humanity, so I think given a couple hundred years to sort of fester, yeah. once the technology is there, they, they certainly wouldn't be opposed to you know trying to kick some human butt, if you will. Brilliant. Oh, I like that. Thank you. That's a good one. How about, uh, how about your long term, then? Okay, well, uh, mine's mine's a bit dark, I think. Is it a serial killer? A prawn serial killer? No, no serial killer. Okay. <laughs> Don't think so. Uh, no, no. Uh, the three years have passed and there's still no return. Vickers now only dreams that he was once a man and finds it odd that he would even think that. He still visits Tanya, but he cannot remember why. The alien population on Earth has been slowly increasing and they've started to do menial labor. They're, they're still treated like rubbish, like slaves, but they're, they're, getting, they're spreading out and... Uh, they become part of the fabric of society. However, five years after they left, Christopher Johnson returns and begins his plan of salvation and revenge. As the ship makes its way through the atmosphere, Christopher Johnson begins to seed the clouds with a new formula based on their fuel, and then it begins to rain, and doesn't stop for three days, and the rain clouds spread around the world. Humanity begins to change. Those not affected by the initial downpour are soon seeing themselves change as the formula enters our drinking water. In just under a year, there are only a few humans left. Some have a natural immunity and they are all moved into camps. Vickers and Tanya, now both prawns, are reunited once more. But hum humanity will soon be extinct. Wow. I like that, though. That, I mean, it's dark, but it's a cool, like, I like the idea of seeding the clouds and, you know, basically changing all of humanity to prawns. I mean, that's that's the ultimate revenge right there. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's hardcore, Phil. I like it. Thank you. It is, it is a bit dark. I just, I just thought because Christopher Johnson had seen all this terrible things that humans have been doing to the prawns and he'd seen what this the fuel does to humans i thought he'd just yeah weaponize it yeah absolutely no that's very cool you know dark is okay once in a while you know yeah yeah definitely yeah, it's a, and this it's a dark movie i mean let's be honest district nine is i you know it's it's sort of packaged in this sci-fi action adventure special effects type of thing but it's dealing with big things isn't it yeah and it's one of the problems I have with the film, which is one of the problems I have with all of Neil Blomkamp's films so far, is that I feel like every every frame of the film is coated in grime. Like, yeah, yeah. when I watch a Neil Blomkamp film, I always want to shower afterwards. I always feel, like, gross and dirty. And I, I it's something about his filmmaking that... I think is what a lot of people like about it. Yeah. It's what I don't really like about it. I When I first watched District 9, I liked it a lot the first time. And then I watched it a second time, and I was like, you know, I... I really don't like this film. <laughs> I, I know, I know what you mean, but it's. I think, I think, especially in District Nine, I think it's. It's. I understand it because it's meant to be this dirty, horrible camp where the aliens are kept. Right. But even when you, even when you leave the uh, the, the camp, it's still it's still got the gr uh, grimness about it. Yeah, yeah. And then he did, you know, Elysium and uh, Chappie, and both of them are very much that same 
you know, dirty, gritty, grimy, yeah. just like I said, makes me want to shower. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, I, listen, I've made no secret of the fact that I, I'm, you know, I'm a sucker for happy endings. I like films that are a little more fun and adventurous and his films i think a lot of people like because they're so dark yeah for my tastes that are just a little darker than i would like well to be to be honest district nine is the, the only one of his that i've really enjoyed right i was really disappointed in elysium i wanted that to, i was too to really like that i just i just didn't think the story was was quite as good i mean it looked it looked really good some of the like uh the space station where everybody lived that was amazing yep. and there was a few bits down on earth and uh Matt Damon was always good, and Shalto Copley was great as the as almost like the vagrant kind See, of. See, his character, I, I didn't care for him in that film, actually. First of all, I couldn't understand a word he was saying. Yeah. I don't know why he had to put on a fake accent on top of his already thick accent. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, to me, it was like every time he would say something, I'm like, what What did he just say? Like, you know, like I needed <laughs> subtitles just to watch the bad guy of the film. That's true, yeah, yeah. And then, then with Chappie as well, I still don't know. I think I was, a, I don't know why, I still don't. Don't think I enjoyed that. Yeah, it's just not a very good film. I think, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, I love, I love seeing Chappie. I thought that was amazing. And again, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was Charlotte Cop Copley playing Chappie. He's right. done great with Neil Blomkamp, hasn't he? Yeah, but, I like Charlotte Copley. Yeah, I think he's a too. very talented actor, and I, you know, I think that he did amazing work as Chappie in terms of that part of the film. But I felt like the the other characters were all very weird, and just you know, it was the film was too long, and just like with every other film I've seen of his so far, it just it's just dirty and gross, and you know, yeah. Didn't Dark. quite say uh, gel, did it? No, not for me, anyway. But all right, well, there you go. So that's our after the endings for District Nine. Phil, do you have any other uh, tidbits about the film you'd like to share? Uh, well, yes, it was going to be Peter Jackson, who did Lord of the Rings and Brain Dead and uh, Bad Taste and all those. He was going to make a film with Blomkamp uh, based on the Halo video games, but that was put on hold due to the lack of financing. So they decided to make District Nine, and it was based on a short film that Blomkamp had done. Uh, called Alive in Joe Berg, which was from 2005. And I believe that Charlotte Copley was a producer on that, actually. I think, yeah, I think that's right. And, and was... then he took somehow, you know, they're friends, and so somehow Blomkamp convinced him to act in the feature-length version of it. Yeah, and it was it's a hell of a thing, isn't it, to suddenly not, not, never acted professionally, and then you're the lead in right. the film, yeah. Right. And apparently all the bits, well, lots of the bits in the, the documentary beginning Copley apparently improvised a lot of that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, he's very talented. His yeah. performance in yeah. District 9 is the highlight for me. That is the one thing about the film that I do really appreciate. Yeah, I think he makes it a lot more accessible in the way he does it. And he, you start off thinking he's an idiot and you don't like him at all, but he, <laughs> right. he brings you around. Yeah, yeah. There's also another link to Peter Jackson. The alien design was um, done by the Weta Workshop. Um, oh, but the, cool. But then the, all the effects were, the alien effects were executed by a company called Image Engine. Mm-hmm. And all the aliens were played by one man called Jason Cope. Really? That I didn't know. No, I know. And uh, I, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the alien language, all the, the chirping and things, was apparently created by rubbing a pumpkin. But I'm not sure. <laughs> I've, uh, really? I've not found any confirmation. Wait, of that, I thought but... if you rub a pumpkin, a genie comes out. Is that? Am I getting confused? It could be, yeah. Or Charlie <laughs> Brown or something. Called right, right, comes right. Out, yeah. right. <laughs> and uh, one last thing about the ending. They shot six endings all together and used one of them, and apparently, and it turns out that one of them is so embarrassing that Blomkamp and Copley will not talk about it, hmm. and they say that that one will never ever be seen. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Interesting. But that's District 9. All right, great. So there you go, our endings for District 9. If you have thoughts or alternate ideas for the ending, drop us a line. We'll tell you how to do that at the end of the episode. Moving on then, why don't we talk about Bridesmaids? Okay, then Mike, uh, walk us down the aisle. Oh, very good. I like that. All right, <laughs> here, here we go. Bridesmaids, 2011 film, as we mentioned earlier, directed by Paul Feig, 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 Paul, whatever you want to call Feig, him. Feig, 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 There you go. <laughs> Uh, it was co-written by Kristen Wiig, who also stars in it, uh, along with her actor friend Annie uh, Mamolo or Mumolo or I don't know. We'll just call her Annie. Yeah. Obviously, that's where one of the main characters gets her name because Kristen Wiig plays Annie Walker, who is a single woman in her 30s, and she's going through a rough patch. Her bakery business has failed. She has no money, and she shares an apartment with two oddball roommates, Gil and Bryn. Uh, Bryn being the first American performance by Rebel Wilson. Oh, yeah, and it's also the, the guy's Matt Lucas, isn't it? Yes, the, the yes. Chapter, yeah. Yep. So Annie is in a shallow hookup relationship with Ted, played by John Hamm. Her best friend Lillian gets engaged, and she asks Annie to be her maid of honor. 
Then we meet the other bridesmaids. <laughs> Bitter Rita, played by Wendy McClendon Covey, who I would like to point out is probably the least famous of the bridesmaids, but in my opinion, probably the most talented. Well, maybe Rose Byrne, but I think Wendy McClendon Covey is one of the unsung comedic uh, actresses working today. Yeah. So you've got her. Then you have naive Becca, played by Ellie Kemper, who is ah. now in uh, the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. I love her. I think she's brilliant. I, I do too. Think, I love her from The Office and then in... Uh, Kimmy Schmidt, I just think it's an amazing show. Yep, yep, yep. So she's fantastic. Then we have obnoxious sister Megan, played by who else? Melissa McCarthy. And finally, we meet somewhat uptight Helen, played by Rose Byrne. Now, Annie and Helen instantly dislike each other. Uh, but then there's some food poisoning and an unfortunate <laughs> incident with a sink. And then there's yeah. an aborted bachelorette party trip, thanks to Annie freaking out due to a bad reaction to a sedative for her flying fears. Eventually, Annie starts dating a cop played by Chris O'Dowd, who is one of the bright spots of the movie. Yeah, I, I do like Chris O'Dowd. And I was reading that uh, they liked, he was meant to have an American accent, but they liked his, his natural Irish accent. So the, uh, that's why I kept it in. Yeah, that was one of the things I liked was the fact that they didn't bother trying to hide it. It's yeah, like, you can yeah. just have an Irish guy, then that's yeah. okay. You know. <laughs> so he plays Officer Rhodes. He buys her baking supplies after they spend the night together and trying to encourage her to start baking again, and so she does. Later, at a party, Annie throws a tantrum, and Lillian kicks her out of the wedding. On her way home, Annie gets into a car accident, gets into a fight with Officer Rhodes, meets up with Ted, and then breaks things off with him. Annie becomes depressed, tries to fix her life, so she apologizes to everyone and uh, reconciles with her friends and helps Helen find Lillian on the day of her wedding because Lillian has run off with cold feet. Eventually, she gets Lillian back to the wedding. Lillian puts her back as her bridesmaid they have, or her maid of honor. The wedding goes on. And after the wedding, Officer Rhodes shows up and he and Annie reconcile and drive off together. Very nicely done. And that is the, uh, the nuptials of bridesmaids, if you will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something like that anyway. Yeah. Now for the reception. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Now for the reception. <laughs> so, Phil, uh, Speech. take us th- <laughs> Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Uh, take us through your day after. Okay, the day after, it's not really that eventful, but it's because uh, it's so soon after what we've seen. But it's Annie and Officer Rhodes. They stop off for coffee and donuts and talk about anything and everything. They're, Annie feels like she's relaxed and she doesn't have to be. Well, she finds herself, she's, she's been coming down from all the stress she's been putting herself under. So, yeah, Annie and Officer Rhodes, Nathan Rhodes, I think it is, they just have a real nice time, real good talk. Uh, Helen Rose Burns' character. And Rose Byrne, I thought she was amazing in the film. She's, uh, she's always amazing. Yeah. I, I really like her. And, I, I you know, I, she's obviously doing very well for herself. But the fact that she's not considered a, you know, movie star at the level of someone like a Charlize Theron or an Angelina Jolie baffles me because she can do anything. Yeah. She's yeah. great in comedies. She's great in, in drama. I mean, she was even the, the lone bright spot of the dreadful Annie remake, you know. Uh, oh, I've not she, seen it. I've not seen it. But you're not one. missing much. But yeah. she was good in it, which was not an easy feat, believe me. Yeah. And she was also in uh, X-Men First Class as well. And, and she's going to yes. be in X-Men Apocalypse, isn't she? Right. Yeah. She's just fantastic in everything. Okay. So Helen, that's uh, Rose Byrne. She begins to reassess her life. Uh, she's very wealthy, but her life seems empty. Uh, but she's made up. She's She's got to know Annie because she realizes there's, she needs friends. She needs people to talk to. Lillian goes off on her honeymoon. And Ted, which is John Hamm's character, he can't understand how he was rejected and a darkness that rises within him once more. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling, if I, if I know you at all, which I think I do, that that might crop up again in a later segment. Let's it see might do. It might do. <laughs> all right. Okay, so what have you got? So after the wedding, Annie and Officer Rhodes, I know he has a first name, but I just like calling him Officer Rhodes. Fair enough. Uh, they spend the night together, and they have a good long talk, and they decide to enter into a fully committed relationship, which I think is helpful for Annie. She starts to feel kind of whole again. She also agrees to start baking again and maybe work towards having her own business, maybe opening another bakery. Meanwhile, the rest of the bridesmaids get hammered at the wedding. (laughs) Helen ends up dancing on a table and embarrassing her rich husband, while Megan ends up throwing up in a potted plant in front of basically the entire wedding party, just bunches of horrified guests. Then (laughs) she continues to throw up again and again, horrifying pretty much everyone at the wedding at this point, and it's uh, a pretty ugly spectacle. Okay. So so there we go. <laughs> nice. How about your uh, how about your immediate aftermath? Okay, I've got Annie continues dating Officer Rhodes and it's going really well. She's really happy. She's she's in a good place and so she's uh now it's time to focus on her what she's gonna do with her life and she wants to go back to baking. She knows she's good at it. She puts a business plan together and so she seeks financing for a new bakery but keeps getting turned down. Helen, meanwhile, has become a good friend with her and sees the trouble that Annie's going through. And Helen wants more in her life, so she says she will 
she'll go into business with Annie and finances the bakery and also starts her own events company. But they're sort of combined. It'll, Annie will help cater to a certain extent, uh, while Helen, who's got a flair for organising things, starts this events business. Uh, Lillian returns from the honeymoon and begins married life properly, and she loves every minute of it. Meanwhile, Officer Rhodes is out driving, and he comes across an abandoned car. Nearby, he finds a dead body, and unfortunately, it will be the first of many. And it's the body of a woman who looks a little bit like Annie. <laughs> so, so not, <laughs> so not only are we uh, maybe maybe hearing from Ted again, but we've got a serial killer introduced. Well, you know, you're just inferring <laughs> that from what I'm. I am inferring. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Good old Phil. <laughs> I can always count on you. Yeah, so what, what about your immediate aftermath? All right, well, I, I will remind listeners that we don't compare notes beforehand because there, there are a few things that we uh, settled on here that are exactly the same. Okay. Obviously, I don't have a serial killer, so. <laughs> uh, Annie <laughs> Not and as far Officer, as you know. As far as I know, that's right. So Annie and Officer Rhodes get married. She keeps baking, and then one day, Helen shows up at her door. Since the wedding, when she embarrassed her rich husband, her relationship with him is soured, and he left her for his secretary. She tells Annie that she got millions of dollars in the divorce, and so she wants to help Annie open a new bakery and help her run it. Where have we heard that before? Great minds think alike. That's right. So they launch a new business together, a new and improved bakery, with Helen handling the marketing and the event planning and Annie handling the baking. At the grand opening, Megan has a bad reaction to a pistachio and a muffin and ends up throwing up in the middle of the bakery <laughs> floor over and over again, horrifying all of the patrons. She, lo she loves just... Uh, getting bodily fl fluids out of it, <laughs> yep, didn't she? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of her thing. Uh, Lovely. The, the local news crew captures it on camera, it makes the news, and goes viral, and basically makes her internet famous. Meanwhile, Ted keeps on womanizing and eventually catches a sexually transmitted disease. He ends up in the hospital and needs a blood transfusion. The only person who's available that has the right blood type is his father, Don Draper. Oh, Lovely. <laughs> Oh, I like that. Yeah. I was trying to I was trying to think of a madman connection, but I couldn't think of one. Oh, I like that though. Thank you, thank you. So that's yeah. my uh, immediate aftermath. How about your long term? Okay, long term. I've got Annie and Helen's business grows and it just gets bigger and better and they're doing really well. Uh, Annie's still seeing Officer Rhodes, who is now a detective after he cracked the case of the notorious highway killer. Turns out, go and try and guess who it is. <laughs> Don't tell me, let me guess. Is it Ted? <laughs> yeah, it was Ted. He caught him and uh he was a bad man. Was he a bad man or a mad man? Hmm. Oh, maybe a bit of both. <laughs> Lillian has had a couple of twins, and Annie and Helen are godmothers to the two of them. Annie ends up marrying Nathan Rhodes, now a detective, so I can't call him Officer Rhodes anymore. Uh, but she can't decide whether to have Helen or Lillian as her maid of honor. Hmm. The end. Tough decision there, I see. But I think, uh, I think it's a satisfying ending. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I like that Officer Rhodes is now Detective Rhodes because he caught Ted. That's a nice sort of, you know, full circle type of thing. Yeah, yeah, he's got a, he's, he's a good cop. Absolutely. So what about your long term? Okay, so for my long term, things are going well for Helen and Annie's bakery. But one night, Annie gets a phone call. Her husband, Officer slash Detective Rhodes, has been shot and killed during a routine <sighs> traffic stop. Oh. Yes, I know. I didn't want to kill Chris O'Dowd, but you'll see. You'll see why. Okay, okay. Annie's distraught, and she basically kind of shuts down. Helen has to take over running the bakery while Annie's in mourning. At the funeral, Megan is so overcome with emotion that she ends up throwing up into the grave in front of all the horrified mourners. Oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, we fast forward a few months later. Annie is pretty much back. Why is there so much vomit? <laughs> well, just because, you know, Melissa McCarthy <laughs> and the sink and everything. I just feel like that, that would continue yeah. in her life. Like that isn't the first time that she's had to, you know – take an emergency dump in a sink, and I think you okay. know, she's just kind of going to find herself in that situation a lot. I uh, can't really argue with that. Right. No. Uh, so a few months later, Annie is basically back to being a recluse, kind of like she was at the beginning of the film. Helen has taken over the bakery full-time. She feels more fulfilled than ever in her life running her own business. One night, while Annie is lying in bed, she's visited by the ghost of Nathan Rhodes. He tells her that he is at peace in the afterlife, and he just wants her to be happy and get back to having a real life. She agrees and sort of starts to bring herself out of her self-imposed exile, but she can't go back to baking because it reminds her too much of him. 
She becomes obsessed with communicating with and understanding the supernatural, and ghosts in particular. <laughs> so she grabs Megan, who isn't doing anything really meaningful with her life besides vomiting all over the place, packs up and moves to New York City, where they become paranormal researchers. Eventually, they start a new business called the Ghostbusters. Nice. Thank you very much. Bring it around. So, yeah. so there we go. That's my uh, that's my long term. As always, tying it into other movies, I can't help it because you've got Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy. It just seemed like a natural. Oh, it's always so much fun doing it. It is. I like it. I can't yeah. help it. I'm predictable. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there we go. So bridesmaids, Phil. What's uh, what do you? How do you feel about bridesmaids? Uh, That's exactly how I feel. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I it was it was an enjoyable watch. I laughed in places, uh, but it's. It, I didn't think it was. It wasn't a great film. It wasn't a bad film. It was just a film, really. Yeah, I I agree. I think this is the first episode where we have two films that I generally don't care for either of them all that much. Usually, yeah. So far, we've done films that I've really enjoyed. Uh, Bridesmaids is not a movie I'm a particularly big fan of. Yeah, I mean, I like I like pretty much everybody in the film. I, I think they're all great at what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good cast, good cast. I just, yeah. you know, Paul Feig, Feig, whatever his name is, doesn't tend to make movies that I I like, and mm. you know, it just this is one of those ones that. And Judd Apatow, you know, I'm not a big fan of just the, sort of his whole you know stable of filmmakers yeah. and style of filmmaking, and so this one's kind of a miss for me. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I like with all of. Judd Apatow's films, I like I like bits and pieces of them, but never the whole thing. It never seems to all quite come together for me. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. So, do you have any exciting trivia about Bridesmaids? Well, well it was the highest grossing R-rated female comedy of all time. Which means I've just alienated our entire female audience, I'm sure. I know, They're... I know. But as, as, as we did say, though, we I, we, I enjoyed all the, the people involved. Yep. I also thought yep. they were brilliant at what they did. It just didn't all come together. There you go. So, you'll be safe from the hate mail, Phil. Uh, yeah. you, can, you can all yeah. just address the hate mail directly to me. I'm Mike. Just send it my way. It's okay. I can take That's it. That's fine. And we'll tell you the email address in a bit. That's right. Um, Melissa McCarthy, she told GQ Magazine that she based her character the look and the way she acted. She based it on Guy Fieri, who does Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, mm -hmm. which I thought I could, I could, I could sort of see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, before filming, the cast spent about two weeks together improvising, and lots of that that stuff that came up in the while well, you were improvising was put in the film. Sadly, it was the last film of Jill Clayberg, who played Annie's mum. Right, and she you will probably know her from uh, the brilliant Silver Streak. Uh, which had Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor, right? And I think we should do the Silver Streak as a and after the ending one day. Sure, I do like that film. Yeah, that'd be great. And one thing I did find interesting, considering John Hamm is also in uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, he used to be a high school drama teacher, and one of his acting students was Ellie Kemper. Oh, really? Yeah, which is a uh, oh, that's fun. Yeah, clearly he was a pretty good acting teacher then, because he's yeah. done okay for himself, and she's done okay for herself as well. I don't know if I, but it must have been mad when she's. She was in something in a film, acting with him, and now she's she's headlining her own TV show, right. and he's like uh, a supporting actor in it. Right. I wonder if though, when they're on set, do you think she still calls him Mister Ham? Yeah, that's true. Because you know how that is. Like when you meet somebody in a certain way, then yeah, yeah. After that, even if you get to know them, you still you still sort of remember them how you always knew them. You know. Yeah, we got to find out. Uh, so Ellie, uh, if you're listening. Uh, give us a call. Let us know what you call John Ham on the set. That's right. And you're welcome to come on the show anytime you'd like. Yes. Yes. Definitely, that'd be good. And John Hammer, if you want to as well, you know, we'll put up with you. Yeah, I guess we can slum it for and him. And his dashing good looks. <laughs> right, right. Swine. Thank God it's a podcast, because we don't want to have him next to the two of us. That would not do much for either of our self-esteems, I think. Well, it, well, it could, could ruin his career, though, couldn't it, when, you know, people realize they have to... <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. They'd see him next to us and be like, oh, well, next to those two dream boats, I guess John Hamm isn't really that that's good it, looking. Yeah. What was it? Was it in Sonic How I Met Your Mama, the, uh, how, how I Met Your Mother, the, uh, the cheerleader effect? There's like a couple of beautiful women, or when lots of women. Oh, yes, for, yes, 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 yeah. yes, that's right. That's we'd, right. We'd have that effect on John That's Hammond. right, exactly. We would, uh, you know. Yeah, and also, the one final thing, Bridesmaid has uh, a connection with the It crowd, not just with Chris O'Dowd, but also with Jessica St. Clair, who starred in the U.S. remake. Oh, the short-lived U.S. remake. Yes, yes, because uh, I... I think I was aware they were going to make one, but I've yeah, never we, seen it. We keep trying to remake British shows, and generally we do a terrible job of it. So Yeah, I mean, you did, did okay with The Office. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of success, yes. I'm not a yeah, fan of yeah. the – I love the original Office. I don't care for the U.S. version, which I know a lot of people like. But, um, but yeah, but other than that, though, I mean, we, I, there's been so many – Come and go remakes of British shows that it's not even it's not even funny. But well, wasn't the one an old one because we had Steptoe and Son? Wasn't that turned into Stanford and Son? Stanford and Son. Yeah. Was that really Stanford and Son was based on a UK? Yeah, it was based on the BBC television program Steptoe and Son. I never knew that. Yeah. Well, there you go. All right. So that's that's one show in the seventies and yeah. one in the two yeah. thousands. <laughs> so we're uh, 
we're knocking them out of the park there with our UK yeah. remakes. <laughs> yeah, so you'd probably do another one in the next seven to eight years. Right, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll look forward yeah. to that then. <laughs> All right, so that's our uh, that's our after the endings for Bridesmaids and District Nine. If you have thoughts that you'd like to share about the endings, feel free to drop us a line. We now are available through multiple platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and email, and we'll share all those details with you in just a little bit. Meanwhile, let's move on to another one of our new features. Last week we did hidden gems, where we talked about a really terrible film. This week we are going to do a new feature called "I Can't Believe I Haven't Seen Blank." So, Phil, yes, would you? Would you like to explain this super self-explanatory feature? Well, yeah, everybody watches films. If you've listened to this, you're watching films. Uh, Mike and myself, we do lots of film stuff online, but there's always certain films you haven't we haven't seen and you haven't seen, and there's always some big films which just passed, passed you by for whatever reason. You never got around to it. You never fancied it or whatever. But there's, there's, there's lots of films out there, and I'm sure you all know some and are dying to let us know. But first of all, we will let you know of a couple that we missed. Yeah, I think everybody has that list of movies that it's like, oh, I know I should have seen this, but I haven't. Yeah. And so we are going to publicly embarrass ourselves by <laughs> picking some of the most notable ones of these. And in this episode and future episodes, we will share them so you can collectively laugh at us and say, how could you not have seen that movie? Yeah. So what do they know about films if they have never it, ex- seen Exactly. I do, I do wonder if we're not you know, shooting our credibility in the foot just a little bit. But like I said, everyone has this list, I think. So... Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of movies. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. There are just some that get missed. Phil, what's your uh, I can't believe I haven't seen for this week? This one, it is Danny Boyle's Slumdog Millionaire. Interesting. Yeah, which won eight Academy Awards. Yeah, so how, how is it you didn't end up seeing that? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think when it came out, I just never got round. I wasn't really going to the cinema that much uh, during that year. So it passed me by at the cinema. And then... It just, I never got around to it. Interesting. To be honest. It's, I don't know why it never, it never really appealed to me for some reason. I'm not sure why, because I, I do like Danny Boyle. Well, that's the thing for me is, you know, yeah. I was mostly interested in it because I am a big fan of Danny Boyle. Obviously, yeah. he's made some amazing films. Uh, Shallow Grave is a, is a movie I love, you know, greatly. And that's, well, that was his yeah. first film. So for, really good movie. Yeah. yeah and that's, again, another future episode movie. But I think Slumdog for me was, was all about, ooh, this is a new Danny Boyle film. I, you know, I want to check this out. So yeah. uh, it's interesting. I, you know, it's a good movie. I mean, I would definitely say it's worth watching. I think being, you know, a few years removed from when it came out, you, it may suffer a bit from, you know, overly hyped disease. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know that it's really one of those Oscar winning films that's going to live up. You know, 10, 20, 30 years later, you're going to go, really? Was that the best movie that came out that year? Yeah, because you do get that in the Oscars, don't you? I think maybe it's also because it did win so many awards. It might have been, it came out, it won all the awards. And then, you know, when you sort of have the opportunity to watch it, you go, well, you know, everybody else likes it. I don't want to, I don't want to watch it because everybody else is saying it's so good. That kind of stupid negativity that sometimes gets into your head. <laughs> right. Well, no, but it's I'm, true. I, I'm not sure, to be honest, why, whether it's just, just one I've never got around to and I've, I should get around to watching it when I get the chance. All right. Well, there you go. There you go. Now you know. <laughs> so what about you? So my pick for this week's I Can't Believe I Haven't Seen is Amadeus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Speaking of Oscar winners, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. never seen Amadeus. And it's interesting. You know, when it came out, I was a kid. Obviously, uh, watching a movie about classical music was of no interest to me. <laughs> and then for several years after that, I had no interest. And sort of the movie kind of fell off the pop culture radar a little bit. But then... Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Right. Yeah. But in more recent years it sort of has crept back on as like a classic. And I've heard more and more people that I know who really love that film and have talked about it a lot. And, and you know, I think as people have grown up and, and been, gone back and rewatched it, have really discovered what a great film it is. Yeah. At least that's what I understand. I've never... Yeah, I, 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 remember, I remember seeing it years ago and I, I remember enjoying it. Right. But I've... It's I've I've not watched it in a long, long time. Yeah, it's one of those films, and, and that's probably you know for me it's like it's one of those ones where it's like I feel like you really have to be in the mood to watch like a period drama about guys yeah. in white wigs and classical music. And I know it's it's a great film, but it's just one of those ones that I'm never really in the mood to go. I'm gonna sit down for a you know really long movie about classical music. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You get that get that feeling all the time when you go and I need I need to watch this or I want to watch this, but. Oh, I haven't got the time or... Right, yeah. because I'm too busy watching Shark and Saw Women's Mis- Prison Massacre. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes I, maybe I need to question my life choices a little yeah. bit more carefully. Or you're just binging on the, the latest TV show right. that you discovered on Netflix. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. well, anyway. Other streaming services are available. There you go. That's right. <laughs> so that's mine. And uh, those are two films that we haven't seen. 
and hopefully uh, you will all forgive us for that. If you have a, a case to make for why we should or should not rush out to see one of these films right now, uh, give us yep. drop us a line. Let us know what you think about them, and we will return to this topic again in the future. I pulled out Amadeus for the first one because I didn't want to shock people. Yeah. I've got two or three really big ones that I'm holding on to for future episodes so that I, I didn't want to I don't want to lose all credibility right off the bat. You know what I'm saying? I got I to gotta ease people into some of the big ones. So fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say I'll just say Luke Skywalker. Who? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. 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 Seen all the Star Wars films. Star Wars. <laughs> right. Huh? Uh, but yeah. If, uh, and also the listeners, if they want to let us know what films they feel they should have seen but have never got around to it, let us know. In all the usual places. Yeah, we'll be happy to share it on the air and embarrass you in public like we've done to ourselves. Yes, yes. Isn't that, doesn't that sound appealing? Yeah, damn right it does. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so there you go. That's our little, our little uh, what did we call it last week? Our sorbet for the ears. That's it, yeah. So now it's time to get into 100 years of films and 100 episodes. Last week we did 1986, which is a very tough year. Lots of great movies. Yeah. This year we're doing 2009. Not so many good movies. Not so many. 2009 was actually a pretty terrible year for movies, I have to say. Yeah. This was yeah. last week's list was really hard to put together because there were so many great movies I couldn't decide which ones would make the cut and what order they would go in. And this week the list was really hard to put together because it was tough to find 10 movies that I really truly loved. Yeah. Yeah. That's was, not good. It was a tough one. Well, before we get into the list, Phil, why don't you uh, take us back in time to 7 years ago, yeah. 2009, tell us what was going on in the world. Well, it's uh Last, last week's 1986, there was lots of wonderful things going on and a few depressing things. 2009, there was lots of depressing things going on and not so many good things. Awesome. But uh, just let's set the scene. So 2009, we had uh, the British Prime Minister was Gordon Brown and President of the United States was Barack Obama, who I think was sworn in in January of that year. There was lots of depressing bombings, shootings and wildfires around the world, and Microsoft launched Bing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, but we had certain things like uh, there was a Russian satellite and a U.S. satellite collided over Siberia. Uh, NASA launched the Kepler mission to search for extrasolar planets. Uh, there was the financial crisis was ongoing. Swine flu was all the rage. And in the U.K., the final few uh, Woolworth stores closed for good. Yeah, good times. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. Super glad Rock we just had to revisit this year. Terrible times and terrible movies. It's a good combination. And let's cheer, cheer us all up by listing some of the uh, the famous people who died. Oh, yeah. please, yeah. please, Phil. Put the cherry on top. Yeah, we had uh, Patrick McGurin, the prisoner, mm -hmm. Ricardo Montalban, mm. James Whitmore, Ron Silver, Natasha Richardson, uh, Marilyn Chambers, who starred in Rabbit, uh, J.G. Ballard, Dom DeLuise, David Carradine, Ed McMahon, Farrah Fawcett, Michael Jackson, Carl Malden, Walter Conkite, Edward Woodward, Richard Todd, Gene Barry, and Brittany Murphy. So Good Lord. I know. It was a bad well, one. let's uh <laughs> Yeah. We're gonna revisit two thousand and nine and we're gonna stay here for as little time as possible. Yeah. And then we'll move on to a much more cheerful year, I hope. Yeah. But let's just I'll just give you a couple more things though about uh, from the Oscars. As we said, Slumdog Millionaire won eight awards, mm -hmm. including Best Picture and Best Director. Uh, the best actor was Sean Penn for Milk. Best actress was Kate Winslet for the reader. Uh, and Milk also won Best Original Screenplay by Dustin Lance Black. And the Best Animated Feature was Wally. -E, and the Best Documentary Feature was The Brilliant Man on Wire. Very nice. Yes. All right, so Phil, why don't you start at the top and give us your uh, number 10 pick for 2009? Okay, my number 10 film is a Norwegian film called Dead Snow uh, by Tommy Wirkola. It's about a group of young people heading up to a cabin in the snowy mountains to go snowboarding or skiing, whatever they want to do. Uh, but while they're there, they are attacked by a bunch of Nazi zombies who are after uh, a hidden stash of gold. It's a great little horror movie, some good effects, some very funny moments. And also there's one of the characters, is, uh, he's really into his movies and he's talking about various horror films and other films as you're watching it. And I really enjoyed it. I only saw it last year, to be honest, but... Um, my friend Pete had seen it. He was raving about it, so gave it a watch and really enjoyed it. Yeah, I like that movie a lot, actually. Yeah. Or, or the uh, Norwegian name is Dodd Snow. Dodd Snow, which is yeah. Very different from Dead Snow. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. It is. It's a good horror comedy. Uh, I like it quite a bit. And uh, the sequel, unfortunately, wasn't as good. But the the first one is definitely a lot of fun. I actually saw that in theaters uh, back in the day. Oh, I can imagine that being a good good one to see in the cinema with a big crowd of people. It was. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's a good pick. Very good. 
Yep. Thank you. And what about your number 10? All right. Well, I'm going to make a lot of people angry with my list, I think, because uh, first of all, I think my popcorn movie sensibilities come out as I I don't have very many edgy picks at all on this list. And uh, frankly, <laughs> it's not even a list I'm overly proud of. So <laughs> we'll see how people react. To okay. It. So e- even you don't like the list? Yeah, even I'm not that thrilled with it. And I will say that a lot of movies that people loved that came out in 2009, I did not like at all. So a lot yeah. of films I think people are going to expect to see on this list will not be on here. And then they're going to hear the ones that are on my list and go, really? I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll start with the first one of those really movies, which is 2012. This would be the Roland Emmerich disaster film about pretty much the end of the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, As we discussed a few episodes ago when we did The Day After Tomorrow, I love disaster movies. And 2012 is one of the most recent big-scale disaster movies. And it really is the biggest scale because it's not just – like the coastline gets destroyed or some monuments get destroyed. It's like the entire world gets destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and the special effects are fantastic. It's, you know, it's it's big, it's dumb, it's stupid, it's loud, uh, but it looks great. And it's one of those movies that I can just sit back, turn my brain off, you know, watch yeah. and enjoy. I, I think the whole thing about the, that one in particular is you're not watching the film for the story. You're just watching it for the next big bit of disaster on you the next city to be destroyed the next you want to see the tidal wave coming over the mountains things like that right exactly yeah. and, I, and i love that stuff i you know so i'm not ashamed but i'm not proud either <laughs> Fair <laughs> so, enough. so that's 2012 my number 10 pick what do you got next okay so number nine i have got sam it's another horror film it's sam raimi's drag me to hell interesting good choice i think yeah which starred alison lerman justin long and it's uh it's a great one about a woman a woman who's cursed and she's then trying to break the curse before she's dragged to hell. Uh, and I really like, I've always liked Sam Raimi's films. And I just thought this was, a, it was nice to see him doing, directing another horror movie again. After I think this was after the Spider-Man films, wasn't it? Yeah, it was after all three of them. Yep. Yeah, so he's, it was good seeing him doing that. And I thought Alison Lohman did a great job. And there was some some classic Sam Raimi scenes and things, the, you know, the, the various ways he, he, he he frames things and cuts things. It was great. It also featured the classic, the Delta 88. That's in all of his films. Right. And uh, there's also, I think it even references the the cabin in Evil Dead. I think Justin Long's character mentions it. So you could almost sort of say they are connected. Right, right. But I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Good film. Well, full disclosure, Phil, I actually have not seen that movie. <gasps> I know, right? And I'm a, I'm a Sam Raimi fan somewhat as well. I do like some of his, his movies quite a bit. And it's one of those ones that, you know, I meant to go see it in theaters and I missed it. And then I meant to watch it on video and I ended up not getting a review copy for some yeah, reason. Yeah. And then I said, well, I'll, I'll get around to it. And, you know, here we are seven years later and I still haven't gotten around to it. But I do want to see it. So good choice. It should it, do. Yeah, it's, it's a good good horror film. It's, it's very funny as well. Right. So it might have made my list had I seen it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself a pass on that one. You can't judge me for not putting That's it on That's fine. I, I'll let that one pass. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So your number nine is? My number nine is another movie that people are going to shake their heads and, and, you know, cock them sideways and scratch their ears and go, really? <laughs> but it is Terminator Salvation. I know a lot of people hated that Ooh, film. Uh, I know, right? I I've, know. I'm, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> you clearly are one of them. You know, I never understood why people didn't like that movie, to be honest with you. I thought it was really cool. I thought that I liked the up action quotient. I thought Sam Worthington did a great job as the sort of human Terminator t- hybrid. I loved the sort of faux Arnold cameo at the end. And I thought it was a neat continuation of the saga. Different, yes, but I really enjoyed it. I saw it in theaters twice, you know, in the the first two weeks it was open. And I thought, oh, what a great film. People are going to love this. And then nobody did. (laughs) I don't know why, Uh, but I really like it. I I have a soft spot for the Terminator movies, I will admit, but I found it to be a very enjoyable, you know, throw it in. It's, again, big, loud action. Yeah. So I know people are, are, you know, are not fans of it, but I am. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what the main problem. I think it was. It wasn't quite what we were, everybody was expecting. I I think they wanted more. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know they. I know they played fast and loose with some of the rules. Some of the Terminators, like the the motorcycle ones and the big giant. Yeah, robot I, d- and stuff. I didn't mind that. I, I like seeing the different different things they did. But I I think I think it didn't help. Like the they did it with Terminator Genesis as well, where they they show a big twist in the trailers from the very beginning. Well, right, yeah. Well, I agreed. The trailers definitely tend yeah. to ruin the stuff, whole thing. With sure. when you find out what Sam Worthington is, that should have been a huge moment where you go, "Oh my God, that explained." Oh, I didn't think of that. Right, right. But it's it was all just. Just shown, and well, I think one of the, the best things though was when you heard the outtake of Christian Bale on set, just really laying into that uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the lighting yeah. guy. Yeah, that was cer- yeah the lighting guy. Yeah, that was certainly yeah. uh, certainly a memorable moment for sure. Yeah, it, well, it it did have it, it had some good bits and everything, but as a whole, I just didn't think it 
it didn't all it didn't come together well enough. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Like I said, I know a lot of people don't like it. I you know, but I gotta I gotta be me, Phil. Gotta be me. Yeah, you gotta stick to your guns. That's right. Like what you like. All right. Even though it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can accept that. I'm okay with that. Okay. <laughs> I won't defend it that hard, you know. Uh, all right, how about your number eight? My number eight is a film starring Michael J. White. Uh, well, actually, I think he wrote it as well. It's uh, Black Dynamite. Yes. Yes. Great choice. Yeah. Really good film. If you haven't seen it, you've just got to go see it. It's, it's fantastic. It's sort of like a spin, a spoof of uh, the black exploitation films. Uh, well, lots of the black exploitation films were as bizarre as Black Dynamite is, but it's it's a real good, fun movie. Violent, sexy, crazy is probably the best way to describe it. Right, and very funny. Yeah, oh, very, very funny. Uh, for Liffa Films, uh, Alan, who writes writes for me, he's uh, he interviewed Michael J. White. And he brought up the subject of uh, Black Dynamite. Mm -hmm. And apparently Michael J. White, he loves Monty Python from when he was younger, oh, from an early yeah. age. And he, he uh, when he was writing Black Dynamite, he wanted to layer it the same way that Monty Python did with their sketches. You know, have some political content, be a bit abstract, a bit silly. Right. And, you know, just cut in strange places and things like that. So it's after, after hearing that and then watching the film again, you can sort of see what he's getting at. And uh, I think he did a really good job. Sure, sure. Writing it, yeah. Yeah, it's a great it's, film. And he's also amazing as Black Dynamite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's terrific. Yeah. He's terrific. And actually, I will say, I that was almost on my list. It's definitely one of those. It, it was, it's in my four, I only have four runners up this week. It's in my four runner ups, runners up because it's such a good film, but it just missed my cut. So, although now that I'm looking at my list and hearing you talk about it, it makes me rethink it. So maybe, maybe I should have <laughs> squeezed it in, but too late, too late. Okay. Okay, so what about uh, what about your number eight? Number eight, I have The Fourth Kind, which is a horror movie of sorts with Carrie Russell, and it's about the classic gray aliens and alien abductions. Oh, I remember I remember the trailer. I never got around to seeing the film. I remember the trailer, yeah. It basically said, you know, you know about three kinds of close encounters, but there's a fourth kind. And um, it's a film that didn't do very well, and it was very under the radar. And I remember getting it to review on, on Blu-ray. And, you know, I popped it in because I like horror movies. And, I, you know, it kind of looked very similar, a lot of, like a lot of the horror films, you know, jump cuts and scares and this and that. And I was thinking, well, I'll just watch it. And it's surprisingly intense, actually. It's about a mom, and her kid is basically being targeted by these classic aliens okay. for, like, abduction. And so weird things keep happening in their house. It's a very tried and true formula. It's basically like... Almost like a demonic possession movie, just with aliens instead of demons. Yeah. So it does it does I, sort of follow the 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 path very you, have a, you know of a traditional kind of possession movie. But yeah, I, I do like the gray aliens. I've always, yeah, it's uh, it's a really cool movie that I thought was much much better than I expected it to be, and it was very intense. I remember being really creeped out by it. So it's it's one of those ones I think it's worth tracking down if you haven't seen it. It's 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 a okay, good ninety yeah. minutes to kill. Oh, I'll have, yeah, I'll keep an eye for that. See if it pops up anywhere. Definitely. All right, number seven. Uh, number seven, I picked went for Zombieland. Very good. Written by Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, who I think wrote Deadpool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Woody Harrelson, Jesse Eisenberg, Emma Stone, Abigail Breslin, and of course the wonderful Bill Murray yes, cameo. Yes, can't beat that. Yeah, it's it's a real uh, a fun zombie movie uh, from the opening credits, which I thought were brilliant opening credits. Yep. It just just starts, just carries on and goes right through, and it's, it's a most enjoyable film. Yeah, probably one of the last really great zombie movies we've seen, actually, because yeah, yeah. there's been so many that now that are so cheap and or they go direct to video, and they're, you know, they're just terrible, so. Yeah, yeah, I, but this one, I mean, they had the uh, the zombie kill of the week, things <laughs> yes, like that. Yes, I just, I just thought it was put together so well, and everybody involved did a cracking job. Yeah, I do love that movie. Uh, there was talk of... First of all, they were going to do a sequel, weren't they? Done Amazon for one of the pilot season. They did a TV show mm -hmm. based on it, which was pretty lousy. Right. Yeah. But I've been reading again. I think I think the sequel is bubbling away again. So I believe it's back on the track. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We'll have to do our after the ending once again. We'll have to do that before they get the sequel out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But I did enjoy that film. Uh, what about your number seven? So my number seven is a family film, actually. Okay. It is Race to Witch Mountain, starring The Rock, Dwayne The Rock oh, yeah, Johnson, yeah. and Carla Gugino. Yeah. Now, 
I'm a I'm a little predisposed to liking this film. I was a big fan of the Witch Mountain films when I was a kid. I love Dwayne mm-hmm. Johnson. I've been in love with Carla Gugino since the movie Son in Law came out, and I think oh, I feel the same way. Uh, Ninety, I want to say. Always loved her. But, you know, the thing about Ray Switch Mountain is it's actually a surprisingly good film. I've watched it a handful of times. It holds up really well. It's it's funny. It has good action scenes. It's very well paced. It's got a good story. The kid actors, who both are, are I believe Anna Sophia Robb is one of them, and the boy's name escapes me, but he went on to do a lot of other stuff as well. Um, yeah. Everyone in it is good, and it's just a really fun movie. It's like one of those movies where you watch it and just go, that was really fun. I enjoyed that. So, you know, it's not highbrow entertainment, but... It doesn't have to be. It's it's very enjoyable, and I think it's somewhat underrated. Yeah, I t- I've 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 seen it just the once, uh, and I I did enjoy it as well. It was a good a good little romp. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like a good fun chase movie with some aliens. So how can you go wrong? And I've got the uh, the, the other kid's name was Alexander Ludwig. Right, he's gone on to do a bunch of other movies as well. But yeah, it was a good film, and I, as you say, Dwayne Johnson and Carla Gugino, you know, they're they're cracking. They reteamed for San Andreas, uh, partially, I think, because their chemistry in Race to Witch Mountain was so good. They make kind of a good on-screen pairing. Of course, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my uh, my number six is District 9. Ah, very good. Which I believe we've already spoken about earlier. <laughs> right, I don't know if we have a whole podcast. lot left to say about it. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll talk you through it, though. <laughs> so it opens in the 1980s. <laughs> <Right>. It's spacious. <laughs> and I have some good ideas for what could happen after the ending yeah, of that movie. Yeah. Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not a huge fan of the film, so it's not on my list. But I can see why you yeah. picked it. Like I said, I know a lot of people do enjoy it. So Yeah, it was it was a good, good change-up from the uh, science fiction films that have been popping around. For sure, for sure, definitely. Well, my number six is also an alien film. It's Avatar. <sighs> Now, here's the thing about Avatar. It's interesting. You know, there was that thing a couple years ago about how, you know, like, quick, name any two characters from the film or recite one line of dialogue from the film, and you can't do it. We need unobtainium. Oh, there you go. Nice job, Phil. (laughs) Uh, But basically the point was that even though it was the highest grossing film of all time, it, it left no cultural footprint. And I don't disagree with that. Yeah. What I don't know is why. I think Avatar is actually a really good film. I think the reason it doesn't didn't leave more of a footprint is there was that there was a backlash against it for being so successful. It's usually the case, isn't it? Yeah. It is. I think you know the movie came out. It made a ton of money. Everybody I know at the time loved it, myself included. I really liked it, and it you know then because it became so successful, everyone was sort of like, ah, eh, Avatar, it's not that good. But you know at the time, everyone thought it was the coolest thing on the planet. I really like the film. It looks amazing. I think James Cameron did a fantastic job of creating this whole new world yeah. using special effects in a way that you know we really hadn't seen to that level before and i think it gets a bad rap because of its because of its success but i think it's actually a really fun you know cool science fiction adventure so i'm i'm not i'm not ashamed to have that one on my list well well avatar of as i like to call it fern gully 3d <laughs> <laughs> yeah no arguments no, there <laughs> uh, no it's uh, i i mean I, I agree with what you're saying it's uh, i sort of the cinema and um, was absolutely blown away by it. The 3D and um, what they what he did with it, the effects mm-hmm. are just phenomenal. Right. And that, that still stands up, but I think it could only it only sort of works when you see it on in that environment on the cinema, the big screen and and 3D. Right. Because I remember watching it on Blu-ray a few years ago, and it just didn't. It just seemed to lose lose some of the power. I think. Sure. Right, that you when you saw because it, it, it ends up becoming almost like uh, you're just watching video game cutscenes. Right. Right. I can see that. And I, I can see that. I, I think I wonder if that's why you know it sort of had the thing. Also, the fact that it did the storyline was pretty. You know, being seen in lots of other things, but that happens in lots of films anyway. Yeah, but I think he kind of took a classic story. Yeah. You know, the Pocahontas, even if you will, and yes, and yeah, sort of yeah. redid it as a. I mean, he could have called it Pocahontas three thousand. And yes. people would have, would have said, oh, it's brilliant, you know, because it's, it's yeah. you know, takes a classic legend, updates it. So, I mean, I, I get that. I understand the criticisms yeah. about this. I, I think it's, I think it's seeing it and that, seeing it and seeing how amazing it is when you're seeing that, that the depth, I think it was the depth that got me most of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, and then when you get, you're seeing it at home and it just doesn't have that and it's like a video game cutscene. Sure, sure. But yeah, totally understand it being on your list, but it's, it's not on my All right, fair enough, fair enough. Moving on. Right, yes. So my next one, uh, we're up to, it's number five. It's a film called Inglorious Bastards uh, by Quentin Tarantino. I, I know that film. I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm a fan as well. Starring Brad Pitt, Michael Fassbender, Eli Roth, Diane Kruger, Daniel Brühl, and introducing Christoph Waltz. Well, I know he'd done lots of stuff before, but that was the first time I'd sort of come across him. And he did an excellent job as Hans Lander. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was the time that most of us saw. I think most of his films prior to that had been European films or foreign yeah, films. Yeah. I think this was his first sort of mainstream American you know, release. So a lot of us discovered him with that movie. Mm. 
But I mean, I think everybody involved was was fantastic. Absolutely. Um, I, the one thing I, I, the reason why it's not higher is I would have personally I wanted to see more of the team on a mission. Right. But I totally understand that why Quentin Tarantino likes to take the the idea of a film and then put it on its head. So we were expecting this big war, you know, big action epic thing, and it wasn't that at all. But it was. It was very good what he did. Yeah. I also remember watching the first time, the scene in the bar, I was thinking, oh, this is going on too long. <laughs> but but then that's all needed as well. And uh, just watching it again when I saw it on Blu-ray, it's uh, it, it wasn't long enough. But that's when that tension's building and you're just going, oh, my God. Right, right, exactly. Also a very funny film. Yes, a lot of humor. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I, and also uh, I didn't realize at the time when I was first watching it, but it, uh, Rod Taylor, the guy from The Birds, and he was also at the time. Yep. Travel in the time machine. Yep. He played Winston Churchill. Yeah, yeah, which, uh, yeah. I love, I, was, I love Rod Taylor. Yeah, that was very cool. I was flabbergasted when I found mm-hmm. that out. So, yeah, yeah. The, the one good thing, one well, not one good thing. Quentin Tarantino does a lot of good things, but one thing I like that he does is he'll bring back you know older actors or people that he loves and give them you know some sort of roles oh, yeah, in his movies, yeah, which yeah. I think is great. You know, yeah. Um, so, well, very good. I like that choice a lot. My number five is a movie that has already appeared on your list. So I think this is our first uh, our first crossover so far, and that is yes, Zombieland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Much like you said, it's a great, fun, very stylish, you know, zombie movie. And I, I think horror comedies are so hard to pull off, but Zombieland pulls it off extremely well. So that's my number five. Good stuff. Uh, my number four is Up from Pixar. Mm, yes, Up. Which, which uh, I thought was a lovely, wonderful piece of animation, and it may, it's mainly so high on my list due to like the first ten minutes, which I think is one of the greatest pieces of storytelling right. uh, committed to film, and the fact that it's an animated movie just makes it even more special. Yeah, I think if if Up had ended after the first ten minutes, it would probably be number one on my list, but it uh, yeah, yeah, it went yeah. on for another eighty minutes or so, and so it didn't make my list at all. Actually, okay, um, this is one of those patented Mike's controversial opinions. I'm not a huge Pixar fan. Okay. I know I just lost yeah. half our listeners right there. <laughs> uh, I apologize, Phil, because uh, all the hard work you put in, and now we're not going to be listeners. But um, I like some Pixar films. I even love some Pixar films, but I find that uh, they're very overrated. And m- there's a handful of movies of theirs that I love, and the rest of them to me are just kind of like well that was okay i've seen it it was good i watched it once okay Going to watch yeah. it again and yeah. up is one of those for me it just doesn't just didn't do it for oh, me no, that's that's totally understandable i mean with cars uh, the pixar film cars right i just thought that was an absolute everyone hates cars oh. and of course that's yeah. one of my favorites oh, is it? <laughs> hands down oh, my love cars. God. i think it's the most misunderstood uh, pixar film of them all i think Everybody's wrong about Cars. I think it's fantastic. I've seen it probably a hundred times because my kids went through a phase where they wanted to watch it all the time, and I liked it even before then. But uh, it, you know, instead of getting tired of it like most people do, I just loved it more yeah. and more. And I think it's an amazing film. And I just okay. someday, someday, I will be validated, and people will come around, and it's going to be like fifty years from now, they're going to study <laughs> that one in film school, and be like, it's going to be like one of those, you know, like it's a Wonderful Life, like you know how it wasn't like a big yeah. success when it came out, and now they show it every Christmas. It's going to be like that. Cars is going to be that film that people are going to say, well, Cars wasn't very well received by critics when it came out, but now it's considered a classic. But there was one man who loved that's it. That's right. That's it, right. If you listen to if you listen to this podcast, we've on earth. <laughs> here's the very moment. Exactly. And I'm, I'm, I'm listen, they're talking to us right now. That's right. Hello, future. Yeah, hello, future. <laughs> Hello, future listeners. Uh, I'm glad I can help educate you on the fact that Cars is fantastic. Now, listen, if that doesn't generate some some emails telling me how wrong I am about things, I don't know what else yeah. I can do because I know people really don't like that movie. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. What about Cars, cars 2, though? Uh, cars 2 is okay. Okay, fair enough. I don't dislike it as much as some people do. I definitely – it's not what I wanted for a sequel to a movie that I really do love as much as Cars. Uh, I mean, I, I do. I love Cars. I can't help it, so – there you go. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. All right, so I've I've got nothing. Moving on <laughs> before I alienate okay. us from any more listeners. My number 4 is Star Trek, the JJ Abrams reboot. Uh, which I believe we've discussed on the show before. I know a lot of the old school Trek fans don't care for it, but I think it's a rollicking good time. It's it's yeah. big fun science fiction adventure. The the cast is perfect, you know, perfect recasting of these iconic characters. And then just to just to really satisfy us Trek lovers, Leonard Nimoy is in there. You know, really, Yike. you know, send it home. Uh, I loved it. it. It looks great. The action scenes are fantastic. Even Chris Hemsworth is in it as uh, Captain Kirk's father. Yes, yeah, and he does a great job. Yeah, and uh, Bruce Greenwood, who's one of my favorite actors, is in it, and he's fantastic. And every time he says that line, you know, your father was a starship captain for eight minutes, and he saved 400 <laughs> people, like... I get like all emotional. Yeah. Like I just I love that so much. It's like the ultimate Captain Kirk moment where he says that to him, and it's like you know it just has such an impact. I think so. Yeah, well, I I agree with everything you say. I thought it was a great film, but it's uh, 
it didn't make my list. Really, not even yeah. not at all, huh? Not not at all. But it was wow. it was the one. It was it was bubbling. Some it was, and then it wasn't, and it didn't quite make the cut. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I I do really like the film. I think it's, it was a great. It was a good way to go. I think with the bringing Star Trek back to the big screen because the the ones with the uh, the next generation that just just weren't making the money. So I can see why they did it, and I did enjoy it. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, what's your next one then, Phil? Okay, number three. It is Watchmen. By Zack Snyder. Hmm. Interesting mm. choice. <laughs> I know. I know. Considering, especially how I thought Batman vs Superman was a bit pants, but uh, Watchmen. I always loved the uh, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' comic, the graphic novel. It's just an amazing piece of artwork and literature. And I thought, I thought the film was. Uh, some people say it was too literal uh, an adaptation, but I, I thought it was a, a great film. I really enjoyed every moment of it. Hmm. You know. I... Watchmen's an odd film for me. I think it's an amazing adaptation of, you know, one of the greatest graphic novels of all time. Yeah. Yet, for some reason, I don't like it that much. I don't hate it like some people do, but I don't like it. But what's weird for me is I can't put my finger on what it is that I don't like about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the cast is great. I think he really captured the spirit of the comic. Yeah. You know, he did everything right, and yet, for some reason, I think it's just not a movie I care for. I think it could be because it... I think taking the Watchmen graphic novel and turning it into a film, I think it would have that effect on you're dealing with some terrible times, terrible people and terrible events, and it can leave a bad taste in your mouth. I mean, a bit when Rorschach, he, he comes across the, the house where the uh, the little girl was taken and he sees the, the dogs in the yard and he realizes what's been going on. And it's, that that's, takes you to the dark places. Right, right. So I can I can understand why, you know, it, it, it can't... It, won't sit well with some people. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. But I, th- I think it was good. I mean, Zack Snyder, I enjoyed 300 and I really enjoyed Watchmen. Yeah. I, th- I think he did a good job with them. All right, so my number three is A Perfect Getaway, which is a very underrated, underseen, very unknown film that I highly recommend to everyone. So basically, it's a, a suspense thriller starring uh, Timothy Oliphant, who's one of my um, favorite actors. Yeah, I love him. Uh, Justified, he's amazing. But oh, like, yeah. actually, everything I've seen him in, he's really good. He's great in everything. Um, Mia Jovovich is in it. Steve Zahn is in it. Chris Hemsworth is in it. And Kylie Sanchez and Marley Shelton are in it. And it's a thriller about a couple on a vacation, and they're out hiking, and they run across another a group of hitchhikers who claim that somebody has been murdered and so they sort of go on the run and bad things are happening and it's very twisty turny that's all i'm going to say about it okay but it is fantastic it is it will keep you guessing right up until the end it will have you biting your fingernails the whole way through (laughs) a lot of familiar faces um doing really good work and it's one of those movies that i saw on home video and i i just absolutely loved it and i try to tell people about it whenever i can and when i realized it came out in 2009 i was very happy to get a chance to talk about it so that people can check it out. So if you really want to find a good movie, um, or, you know, one of those nights you're looking for something a little bit different, yeah, check out A Perfect Getaway. Yeah, I remember that one coming out. I remember the trailers and things like that. I never got around to seeing it, even though I did like pretty much everyone involved in it. But I think it was my brother who saw it. Yeah. Apologies if it wasn't, but I remember them telling me about it. and It, it sounded like a cracking film. It is. It really I mean, cause is. Because I always like Steve Zahn. I, I think he's a brilliant actor. Yes, yes, he's great, and everyone's really good in it, yeah. actually. And it, like I said, it, it keeps you guessing, and it just really does some some neat things. And it's just suspenseful. It's one of those movies that really you get that twisting in your gut from almost the start, and it doesn't let up until the very end of the film. So cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten all about it. So I'll, most I'll people to, probably to have. Watch, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the people who've even heard of it have probably forgotten about it. Most people probably haven't even heard of it. But if you haven't, like I said, I, I highly recommend it. So go check it out and, and let us know what you think. Okay. All right. How about your number two, Phil? We're getting down to the home stretch now okay number two it is a film directed by bruce mcdonald written by tony burgess and starring the wonderful stephen mccatty it is a film called pontypool ah uh, yes pontypool i have always wanted to see that and i have uh, not i'm sorry to say it's an amazing film i remember i was having a movie night and i got some friends around and put it on and uh, it's just incredible it's uh, if you haven't seen it and i don't think many people have no, it was very limited release. Yeah, although I know whenever I put stuff on the Liver Films Facebook page, people always comment on it. And really, it's, I think it's got like a, a, a bit of a cult film going on. Yeah, but uh, it's it's a, it's all dealing basically. You'd, you're following a guy, Grant Mazzy, who's a, a DJ, and he's working at the radio station, and it's it's snowing and everything, and he's doing going to doing a show, and then he gets get keeps getting reports and of strange events, people getting attacked in town, and he's trying to put it all together. And we we never leave the. Uh, the radio station but eventually it turns out people are becoming almost zombie-like but it's uh the virus is being spread by words 
Right, right. Which is a very good take on things. And uh, I think uh, Bruce McDonald, the director, he says they're not zombies, they're called conversationalists. <laughs> very so cool. It's, uh, it's a great film. The way it's put together and the way it builds, it's, uh, it's great. Really good yeah. film. Yeah, it's one I've really wanted to see, actually. And I, I mm. can't believe it came out that long ago now. I keep thinking, like, it just came out two or three years ago. Yeah, I know. I know. It just flies by. And I'm like, oh, I got to get to that. because I remember, actually, one of, my, one of my writers at the website interviewed the director and went to a screening of it. But it was down in New York City, so I couldn't go. But um, it's one I've really wanted to see for a long time because that's just my kind of movie. I really love those types of films. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm going to say that chances are very good it would have made my top ten had I gotten around to seeing it. Now I'm going to have to see it really soon because I'm, I'm really, like, <laughs> I'm like, dang it. I can't believe I've yeah, waited that long. So, it's, it's, so I'm going to track that one down. It's well worth it. Very good. All right. Well, my number two, we will celebrate by Slapping the Bass, and it is I Love You, Man, starring Paul Rudd and Jason oh, Segel. that's another one I never got around to seeing. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, missing I know, out. Cause... You are missing out for sure. Because I like the two of them. Yes. It's sort of a um, spiritual sequel to Role Models, another film that yeah, I love I... with uh, also Paul Rudd. Yeah, I enjoyed that one. And Sean William Scott. And so basically, you know, it's it's Paul Rudd has a hard time, you know, making friends because he's just a busy adult, normal human. And so he becomes friends with Jason Siegel, who's a bit of an oddball. And uh, just watching their friendship develop, there's there's so many great lines, so many laughs. And I can relate to, to Paul Rudd's character which I think is certainly one of those things that, you know, helps helps uh, bring you into a film. But it's very, very funny. Uh, and I've watched it multiple times. I never get tired of it. So you should definitely definitely watch that one. Phil. OK, yeah. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get around to that one as well. Oh, there's a few, yeah, good few films on our, both of our lists that we both want to see. That's what makes this fun. All right, so it's time for the big reveal, Phil. What was your number one film of 2009? It was Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Squeakle. No, sorry, no, no. It was, uh, yeah, my number one. Hey, my kids would probably pick that as their number one, actually. So those films aren't aren't bad for what they are. I'll say that. But the, ki- the kids dig it. Uh, but yeah, good choice. Okay, so your real choice. Yeah, the real choice is Moon by Duncan Jones and starring Sam Rockwell. I had a feeling that might be your pick. Yes, I I think it was a brilliant film. It was Duncan Jones's first feature. He, he did lots of commercials and things like that, but he took five million dollars and turned it into a brilliant film. A uh, great science fiction film with some amazing practical effects. And Sam Rockwell, as always, was wonderful in it. And also Kevin Spacey did the voice of uh, Gertie, yep, the, com- yep. the computer. Right. But yeah, I remember I remember seeing it and just being blown away by it. You know, Moon is one of those films that I like, yeah. but I don't love. That's and fair enough. I, I know that's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's another one also. I can't put my finger on why. And I feel like I'm a broken record now. But it, it's a good film. Like, I, I have nothing bad to say about it. It's an interesting story. Uh, you know, like you said, the performances are great. I think for me, it was a little on the slow side. Yeah. Um, which isn't a bad thing per se. But no, I can see that. I can see what you mean. I like it. I, I, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about it. But it's just not one of those films that I've never felt the need to go back and watch it again. I, I've never felt the need to really rave about it to people. You know, it's a solid science fiction thriller. Yeah. But I just couldn't get excited about it. So, but good choice, good pick. I no, I can, I can, I can, I can see your point totally. But uh, I mean, you could almost say it's sometimes you're watching science fiction films which are good, but they have a bit of a Twilight Zone episode kind of feel to it. Right. Right. Yes. This one definitely. This does. one. This one. It's. I mean, it's the, the basic story could be a like, Twilight Zone episode, but I just the way it was put together, and I think it was. I mean, the fact I don't think it would have worked with anybody else, but Sam Rockwell, he just carried it so right. well because he's. He's got such a big. It's basically just him every scene, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is. And and you know, like you said, for what he did with five million dollars, it's very impressive. Oh, it's, it's a very yeah. impressive film. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people really love it, so I'm sure a lot more people are going to agree with your list yeah. than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget, I had 2012 on my list. So yes, yeah. Um, but but yeah, no, it's a great choice. It's a great choice. Also had a brilliant uh, soundtrack by Clint Mansell. But yeah, that's it. So what? But. Uh, Enough about me. What about your number one? <laughs> well, once again, it's a film that has already been on your list. You like to steal my thunder. I'm okay with that. Uh, Clearly, I, I rank some things higher than you. Yeah. Uh, and it is Inglorious Bastards. Oh, lovely. Now, Inglorious Bastards was interesting for me. I was at a point where I wasn't really sure where I felt about Quentin Tarantino anymore at this point. You know, yeah. I, I like Quentin Tarantino quite a bit. I, I consider myself a fan. You know, Pulp Fiction, as we talked about last week, I love. Jackie Brown, not really a big fan of. Um, then he did the Paul, the Kill Bill movies, and I have a weird relationship with the Kill Bill movies. I hate the first one. Oh, yeah. passionately, yes, but I love the second one. I think it's brilliant. Oh, that's that's, so, that's an unusual thing because people it is people usually have to get the way around. I really I love both of them to be honest, but right. 
But usually when I've heard about it, people love the first one and dislike the second. That, well, I, I, as always, I go the opposite <laughs> direction. What can I say? I, obviously, I'm just weird. But So so when, when Inglorious Bastards came out, I was excited to see it. But, you know, I was sort of like, well, is this going to be the good Quentin Tarantino or the bad Quentin Tarantino? I don't know. You know, it's a, like a three-hour movie, you know. And then that first scene with Christoph Waltz, you know, and the kids under the under the floorboards. Yeah. The suspense of that scene, I was like, I could barely breathe. It just cranks up and up, doesn't it? it just oh, it's yeah, it's amazing. It's it's almost like it's almost like a full movie that opening scene. That's like that's <laughs> one every movie. kind of segment in the film is almost like its own movie. You know, yeah, yeah. And so after that tension lets up, then he does it again with the barroom scene, like you were talking yeah, about, yeah. where the tension just ratchets up and up. I'm like, how can you get away with that twice in the same movie? It keeps going. You know, um, just you know, Michael Fassbender, Christoph Waltz, so many great people in it, and. And, um, you know, the ending's a little over the top, but even that, I, I just, I really enjoyed it. And it sort of re- restored my faith in Quentin Tarantino. And I've, I've really enjoyed his films since then quite a bit. So, so yeah, so that's my, my experience with Inglorious Bastards. Oh, that's not a cracking choice for number one. I think two good lists there with a, a good, good mix and range of movies. Yeah, well, mine definitely skews a little more towards the mainstream popcorn crowd. Mm. But, uh, and some, some would argue that, the crappy movies but you know it's, it's my list it's i can pick is, whatever yeah. i want yeah because uh <laughs> we'll just uh we'll just remind you all that uh we're not saying these were the best films of the uh the year they're just the ones that we enjoyed the most exactly how about any films that just missed the cut for you phil besides what we've already talked about anything else yeah there's just a, a just a few more there's a, i would have mentioned star trek there was also i think crazy heart uh, there was a couple of animated ones which almost made the cut Coraline and fantastic mr fox Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a great documentary, The Cove, which was all about the uh, the dolphins right. being killed. Uh, right. So it was a bit, bit of a down. I don't think I'd watch it again, but it was an amazing documentary. <laughs> but uh, right. And then there was also a little British science fiction one, which also starred Chris O'Dowd, who we've already mentioned, uh, frequently asked questions about time travel. Really? Yeah. Now, that's not one I'm familiar with. Uh, it's it's just a, it's about three friends who are going to go to the pub. And they find they find a way. I think it's in the I think it's in the gents' toilets. <laughs> they find they find a portal, which means they can go through time. And then they keep coming across themselves from the future and the past. And it's oh, yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, I mean, so I, I know when it came out. out, some people really didn't like it, but I I thought it was a a fun little movie. Sure, sure. Oh, and there was one other one, uh, Coco before Chanel. Which starred Audrey Tattoo. Right, right. So what about you? What what are your misses for you? Well, I only had four. Like I said, 2009 was a terrible year for movies. Yeah. Um, and uh, a Black Dynamite, as we mentioned earlier, was one of them. Yeah. Uh, the other ones for me were Sherlock Holmes with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, well, yeah, an, I enjoyed that one as well. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, which is uh, an animated film. Yeah, it's, a, it's an enjoyable watch, that one. I watched it a few times with uh, my daughter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And 500 Days of Summer, starring Zoe de Chanel and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, which is a rom-com of sorts that I enjoyed greatly. That was the Mark Webb one, wasn't he, before he did Yes, it? yes. Yeah. And I was, was... that's why I was excited about him taking over the Spider-Man movies, because I really enjoyed 500 Days of Summer. It's, it's a rom-com, but it's very different from your traditional, you know, boy meets girl rom-com. It's done in a sort of, uh, you know, time-jumping narrative. Yeah. The relationships are really real. The, the comedy is very funny. It's a, it's a film I do enjoy quite a bit. It's, an, it's another one of those 2009 films which I've, I've not seen. There's quite a few, wasn't it, on your list? And now this <laughs> one, oh, my God. Well, there you go. See, we both have some schooling up to do. Yeah. It's one I always wanted to see because I like everybody involved. Right. I, I liked when I was reading about it and how it was put together. I was like that. So, yeah, yeah I'll have to get on to that one. It's, I, I recommend it. I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit. Yeah. All right, great. So that was our top 10 films of 2009. Phil, how did we do uh, compared to the box office? I'm guessing fairly different in some cases. Uh, qu- quite a lot different. There's a, only a, a few films. Well, how many? One, two, three. I think there's three. No, four films that we, uh, we've we mentioned Okay. combined that were on the top 10. All but right. this is from uh, Box Office Mojo, who had the top 10 films for 2009, starting at number 10, Sherlock Holmes. Right. Number nine, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the sequel. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't that far off. No. Uh, Eight was The Blind Side. That was the uh, Sandra Bullock film. Yep. Seven was Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Six, The Hangover, which... Mm, mm, Yeah. Not a fan. Not a fan. No, no. Five was up. Right. Then we have four, three, and two are all sequels in uh, long-running franchises. Uh, Number four was Twilight New Moon. Mm -hmm. Number three was Harry Potter, The Half-Blood Prince. Right. And number two is Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Yeah. At least that didn't make my list. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, What do you think number one was? Uh, It's got to be Avatar. Yeah, you're correct. Right, that wasn't a hard one. It made a ton of money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it made a few, a few yeah, bucks. Yeah. 
So very good. Well, that's our uh, our top ten lists. Uh, if you would like to tell us where we went right or wrong, in my case, I'm guessing mostly wrong. Uh, <laughs> you can drop us a line. Phil, you want to tell us how people can reach us via social media? Yes, you can find us on facebookcom slash podcast. and you can find us on Twitter with uh, at after underscore the ending. And now we have an email address as well. So if Yay! you're not on social media, that's right. If you're not on social media at all, you can still reach us. Our new email address is after the ending at verizon.net. That's V E R I Z O N, or just like you see in all the commercials, which are on TV every 12 and a half seconds. Unless you live in the UK and then. Oh, you guys don't have Verizon <laughs> over there? No, well. Uh, we might do, but... But it's not big like over here? They don't really advertise much if we do, no. No, they're not one of the big ones. All right, well, there you go. That's that's yes. why I spelled it then, for all of our international listeners. So after the ending at verizon.net, you can reach us there. Drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. If you send us a pithy or clever email, we might even read it out on the air. Yes. And uh, there we go. So, Phil, where can people find you online if they want to track you down? You can find me at, mainly at liftforfilms.com. Uh, and there's also associated Twitter, Instagram... Facebook, Google+, Plus, Instagram, blah, 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 all the other usual places. So that's liftforfilms.com. There you go. And um, where, where else can they find you? Because you've got a new website set up for your books and things. I do, as a matter of fact. So you can now keep up with me at wordsoutloud.com, where you can follow uh, all sorts of things. I'll be talking about the podcast a little bit on there. I also have my um, fiction works up there as well. You can find out about appearances I'll be doing. All kinds of good stuff. And right now, also, if you go to wordsoutloud.com, you can get a free audiobook. What, free? That is right, folks. Completely free. I can't believe that. It's free. Can you believe it? It's free. Uh, yeah, so it's an audiobook that I did of my first book, Bloodsucker Blues. It's completely free. Free! Send it over to my website and download it. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Or as I like to tell people, you will, you will love it or have some other opinion about it, I 100% guarantee it. You can't argue with that. You really can. <laughs> okay, so Phil, why don't you tell listeners what we're going to be talking about next week? We have an exciting episode lined up for all of you listeners out there. Yeah, can't rain all the time, Mike. That's right. Yes, we'll be doing After the Endings for The Crow and The Jerk. That's kind of a nice... The uh, only thing in common is they have the... In the, the title. Right, the followed by a short four-letter word. So, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is uh, two very different films, but I think that's what makes it fun. But I'm very excited to announce we're going to have our first special guest next episode. I recently had the chance to speak with Rochelle Davis, who played Sarah, one of the main characters in The Crow, and I got her to share her after the ending for her character in the film. So we're going to get to talk to her about what she thinks would have happened to Sarah and some of the other characters from the film after the ending. So we're very excited to be able to share that along with our endings that's so cool can't wait to, to listen to, to what she has to say yeah yeah it's good stuff yeah. it's good yeah. stuff so we'll be sharing that next week and what year are we going to be doing next week Phil we will be going back to the 70s and 1974 1974 I have no idea what happened that year or what movies came out but I'm sure it will be exciting to find out I can safely tell you that stuff happened <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's about it at the moment, but 1974 should hopefully be a good year for films. We'll find out. All right, well, that's going to wrap us up for this week. As always, we thank you very much for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, please, please take just a minute and swing on over to iTunes and consider leaving us a rating and or a review. That really is a great help to podcasts. Can't even tell you how important that is. So if you could take a couple minutes and do that, we would appreciate it. And even if you can't, that's fine. We thank you for listening anyway. Yeah, or if you've listened to it and you haven't quite enjoyed it, but you know people who will enjoy it, let them know. Um, spread the word however we can. Okay, then, as always, I am Mike Spring. And I'm Phil Edwards. And we'll see you next week. After the ending. Uh, she also agrees to start baking again and work towards maybe even opening her own business again. I just said again like 37 times. Go on, try again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Annie decides... Oh, sorry, let me... I'm just going to... Yeah. yeah. So what about your long term? Oh, sorry, excuse me. Wow, that's an amazing ending. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? You know, I don't hold anything that's, back. Sums it up. I'm sure some people would, uh, you know, <laughs> no, forget <Okay>. it. <laughs> was, that, was that Melissa McCarthy's character? <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. That was me channeling Melissa McCarthy's character. <laughs> All right, so my film that I, this week, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And they, and they re-teamed for Avatar, I think, partially because they were so good together. Uh, not Avatar. For, I was gonna sorry. say, what? <laughs> uh, how about any, um, any, uh, any? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yes, you can find us on. 
Donald Dom. What is the <laughs> Facebook.com.